Hello everyone, myself Saurav Sharma. I, I had product marketing for Datamatics Intelligent Automation products and today we are going to cover the topic of intelligent automation using robotic process automation, intelligent document processing and AIML and of course the focus is on how to select the right tools and reduce total cost of ownership. So if we look at how the traditional business operations have moved and this is all about to move towards digitalization so initially you had a lot of erp instances there was enterprise data center now most of that has moved to the cloud um, automation technologies including rpa ai machine learning nlp advanced analytics are being used uh, so people are using centralized database but if you look at the top column in terms of processes uh, knowledge based processes are where the bots have made significant inroads as well as those processes where human bot collaboration is required In the traditional side one of the major issue was how to process high volume of unstructured data uh, manual processing of monday stars if that's done by humans it consumes a lot of time and energy and of course, uh, there's always the angle of elevating human potential to focus on things which are more strategic and high priority. Of course, there are legacy applications that do not expose a web service or an API. So how to integrate with that? That was a major issue. Now, increasingly, you need to interact and manage customer interaction across a plethora of channels, not just one channel. And all of that has driven the move towards uh, digital business operations so we talk about improving process efficiency how to make workforce more productive and happy enhanced employee experience more so in the last one year since we have the start of covid pandemic and so on and so forth now let's step back and see how we landed up here so we start about 2016-17 that's when RPA hype was at its peak and most of the enterprises were using RPA to do task automation. So the potential value to the business was not much, but there was a long tail of opportunity that was uh, automated using RPA. Then we made the move towards more use case uh, based automation. So RPA, some AIML, lesser number of opportunities but the potential value to the business was more because we we're focusing on high value high business value automation now what we see in the last 18 months or so is enterprise automation coe leaders enterprise automation leaders chief digital officers chief innovation officers enterprise architects and cios they are looking to use multiple automation technologies to deliver end-to-end -end automation. So while the number of opportunities from the perspective of doing end-to-end -end automation might be less, but the potential business value for the enterprise is pretty high. And that's where we are making the move. And then when we say intelligent automation, it's not just about using a tool, but a collection of tools. Of course, integrated platforms, not disparate uh, tools working in silos. And that's what we'll talk later on. No, from a technology perspective, if, so first we were looking from a past perspective and how things sh shaped up in the last five years. From a technology perspective, so started with the robotic desktop automation, which was the classic case management in the BPM realms. Then we moved to robotic process automation, which was digital triggers or cell service, unattended automation. But with that kind of uh, process driven approach to automation you can only achieve that much automation say 50 percent 60 percent and many enterprises realize that the reason rp doesn't scale or automation is not delivering true business value to the enterprise is because you are just targeting those low hanging opportunities which are of not much business value anyways and then there is, of course, the need, whether you like it or not, you just can't get away from unstructured data. 80% of the enterprise data is unstructured, so you need to tackle it. Uh, how to convert unstructured and semi-structured data to a structured format, that's a major challenge for most of the enterprises. 
And that's when you make the move toward machine learning where you prescriptive analytics, decision engines, more data-driven approach to automation. But the end game there is to achieve a greater degree of straight through processing with accuracy. You might as well achieve 70% STP with 95 plus minus 3% accuracy. That's the target. Uh, 60% automation is not good for most of the enterprise these days. Now, as datamatics, what do we bring to the table is the datamatics intelligent automation platform. So if you look at the top layer, there we have all sorts of applications, we have desktop applications, web applications, Citrix environments, enterprise applications, your SAP, CRM, supply chain management, all those kind of applications. Legacy applications, as I mentioned, that do not expose a web service or API. And RPA, which is a true bot RPA, which is a flagship RPA product that interacts with the application layer. So there are four core architecture components of the product. One is designer, which is local visual designer. We have about 500 built-in pre-built component library, which you can use to just create automation flows faster, universal recorder, and we can run multiple processes on the same bot. So multi, these are multi-skilled bots. We can have process versions. We can maintain different process versions around that. Cockpit is uh, as if this was an airplane. This is the most important part. It's the CPU. We have centralized monitoring and control and management, uh, enforcing and making sure that data at rest and motion is secure, so data security and governance. Uh, capabilities and then how to deploy and what is the utilization. And now digital workforce is pretty much your software box that you which is nothing but an integration script if you look at from a code perspective. So you have them in an attended and unattended mode. Attended is when human bots actively collaborate and pass some tasks to each other. And unattended is when bots pretty much do a series of tasks. Might not be 100%, 80% automation, but it's a series of tasks that bot does on its own. And on the analytics bit, uh, we have operational KPIs, RY calculator, actionable intelligence for business users. So that's how the true bot product looks like. Of course, you can deploy it on a physical or virtual machine, on premise deployment is supported, cloud deployment is supported. Hybrid is also deployed. Deployment is also supported, but we see that most of the time customers ask for on-premise or cloud. The true cap plus is uh, our uh, uh, IDP, intelligent processing product. So if you see on the right side, you can see a lot of uh, documents coming in, having unstructured, some unstructured data, and for some times unstructured data. And you apply pre-processing, which is basically getting the documents in the right size and shape before doing the extraction using OCR. So we do cognitive capture there. And then in case you want human intervention, if it's of financial value and, and decimal place here and there can mean a lot. Just to give an example, 1864 and 18.64, that's a huge difference. Sometimes it could be millions of dollars, so it's always good. You can also mandatorily set that 5%, 10%, 20% of the full of specific document set should go for QC. And then you can export that data in a structured format. Or it could be uploaded to a CRM, an ERP, or you can just pass it on to an RPA bot, which can do the further process. The right-hand side, you see AI ML model, so that's the AI ML NLP uh, IP developed by Datamatics Data Labs. So you leverage those models depending on the use case. We also consume APIs from the likes of AWS, Google, Microsoft, and others. So it's pretty open in that sense. You can call APIs, consume that specific AI ML NLP capability and do the process. Again, TrueCap on premise and cloud deployments are supported. Uh, we want to be predominantly cloud because that's where I think for this type of tool, cloud deployment model is best suited for economies of scale and SaaS economics uh, comes into play as well. Now, why do we need an IDP solution? So I'm just trying to set the background before we get into the discussion. Uh, so RPA, it's a wall, can't do much when you have unstructured information uh, or semi-structured information, it does a good job. 
in automating a series of tasks, but uh, not much beyond that. And whether you like it or not, you just can't get away from unstructured data. Many analysts predict that it's over 80 percent in the current enterprise setup, and it's still rising. So you have to process it. Either the human should process it, or a digital worker or an IDP tool should process it with accuracy and speed. So while OCR does a good job in terms of just the basic digitization of paper-based information as such, but there are inherent quality issues. So accuracy, even in the best case scenario, so you have the best quality documents, best quality scanners, but the accuracy is still less than 60%. And many automation leaders and enterprise IT leaders think that if I'm going to do less than 60% automation and spend a lot of time in doing error resolution, the rest of the processing might as well not do that kind of automation. Yeah, so those challenges can't be ignored. Many people tried using a bunch of Python with OCR in the form of intelligent OCR that still didn't deliver about 70% lesser than that accuracy. And that's where IDP solutions come into play. So in one statement, if I were to define the value proposition of IDP solution, it's pretty much converting the semi-structured and structured data to a structure. And for further processing or just uploading to any enterprise application, database, or any other system. In terms of the key uh, differentiator, so it's a template-free product. So if you have to use the Abbey's automation anywhere I can got, then you see that there's a lot of time. Pre-automation phase is pretty extensive. You just create a lot of templates without realizing any benefits of automation. Sometimes you're doing it on own, or sometimes you're spending on professional services, consulting hours. So we want to take that pain away from the equation. So through CAP plus IDP reduces the setup time by 30 to 70 percent. We did some mental benchmarking, ran different products together with a bunch of uh, document sets, and that's that's the number we got there. Of course, uh, the system is based on AIML, so there's continuous learning, cognitive capability, deliver a greater degree of STP with accuracy, that's the end game, as I mentioned earlier. And you want to reduce the manual effort and save time. Now, in terms of deployment flexibility, and I think that trend had already started before COVID, but after COVID, it has accelerated. More and more IT workloads are moving to the cloud. And there are some famous CEO of Oracle had mentioned that in the next five years, 80% of enterprise IT workloads will be in the cloud. We see that that might happen. That trend is accelerating. So we we believe that from a true cap plus perspective, because the kind of product it is. Uh, the kind of flexibility you need in terms of infrastructure capacity and scalability, cloud is the way to go. Uh, we have been doing business process services, document processing for about two decades now, so we understand the knowledge worker persona, what are their pain points, what kind of look and feel is good for them from a UX perspective, ease of use, user productivity perspective, so we've designed uh, taking that into account, browser-based access, and the cloud gives you a SaaS product like feeling. So do definitely check out, check that out. And as I mentioned, when we integrate it with TrueBot RPA or any other leading RPA product, because like as I said, it's an open product, you put up a platform API so you can integrate with any other RPA product. But if you want to use TrueBot RPA and TrueCap in tandem, then you can automate a series of tasks, and then the next step might be to ingest data from a document, convert it to a structured format, or there are other variations of this combination. But the reality is when you combine the two products, RP and IDP and AIML, we are going to achieve a significantly higher degree of automation. And the business value of that automation is fairly significant than just doing mere task automation. From a Pricing perspective, it starts with a few thousand documents to goes up to millions of documents, pretty competitive in that sense. Now, uh, before we move on to the discussion, I just wanted to highlight, just go to our website or just copy this URL. If you go to our website, you will definitely find this one. Uh, there's an enterprise free trial running for about 30 days. So you can process up to 5,000 pages. So do check us out. We are always there to help you get started on your journey.
So do definitely try that. There's a lot of uh, help available in terms of videos and demo uh, that should help you get started. But if you are stuck somewhere, we are always there to help you. So do check out the True Cap Enterprise free trial. Now, lastly, uh, in terms of recommendations, so consider cloud deployment option for TCO savings and infrastructure uh, flexibility. You don't want to spin a server every now and then when you run a new process. So definitely do that. Uh, adopt a platform approach to automation. So think of this, uh, you want to use RPA, IDP, AML, and you want to use it from vendor ABC the whole idea of getting up and running the, the product integration, that is one of the friction points. Then the other thing is getting people to train on different products. The user experience is going to be different. So there are a lot of friction points. What we provide is an integrated uh, platform with those capabilities so that you can get up and started and realize the true value of automation. So keep that point in mind. As I mentioned earlier, leverage AI ML capabilities for intelligent automation. And process-driven approach is good for task automation, but when we're talking about unstructured, unstructured, and structured, uh, semi-structured data, then you need to follow a data-driven approach to automation. So keep that in mind as well. Now, is with, as with any strategic initiative, business IT alignment is key. Uh, it's very important to reduce the friction between people, process, and technology aspects. So Okay, you have a tool, but as I always say, a fool with a tool is still a fool. So you need the right kind of skill. You need to pick the right process for automation, whether it's a good fit for RPA, whether it's a good fit for IDP. Do you have the right skill in-house or from external sources? Then you need to do the training and make sure that you build that competency in-house. And the second thing is the chain management. So bots are going to part, become part of your workforce so reducing the friction between human and bots that's also going to be key but the most important thing is you need to establish a coe for systematic adoption at enterprise level and with that i mean governance making sure that you're not creating islands of automation infrastructure you are not creating shadow it within the enterprise and also you can have very specific uh, policies uh, whether it's data security privacy uh, that needs to be enforced uh, some people might be working in one geography some others so how to make sure that you've all they all follow the same and i mentioned change management and development of automation skills is pretty important coe allows you to make sure that that change management and development of automation skills happens in the right uh, uh, framework so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Sashi Bhargava and Rajesh Agrawal. Sashi is our EVP and head of product engineering for Datamatics, TruePod, and TrueCap. And Rajesh is our senior vice president and head of RPA practice. He has about more than a decade's experience in this field. So, yeah. Uh, this, uh, thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, so I will start with uh, Sashi. So we, we I, I briefly touched upon the value of AI, machine learning, and NLP. But from your perspective, what value these capabilities, these IPs, and this could be from any vendor, they bring to the table in terms of enabling intelligent automation? And is it just only about tackling unstructured data or there are some other aspects to this paradigm of automation? Mm -hmm. okay. That's an excellent question, uh, Saurabh. And uh, if you look at the lot of uh, tools, if you talk about AI, ML, NLP in the intelligent automation that is picking up, I think a lot of our customers, the way we see the market, Okay, the basic RPA has been done, which we, I think you ran through the first two slides. Now people are looking at to make our automation processes, how intelligent we can make it. And AI, ML, NLP, all of them have a contribution towards that. Like for example, when we are trying to extract data from the unstructured and the semi-structured document, the kind of different machine learning models, the kind of neural network models, 
or are, we need the document classification for the different kind of text, maybe the contextual text, which we need to extract. Like for example, take a contract document or a legal document where you want to extract certain data, all these kind of different models are extremely useful. We are seeing a good adoption of this model, which is being done. Even like, you know, like uh, the extraction piece, like in our true cap product as well, we have n number of models which are being done, like one of the most critical ones, which you see is extracting data from tables. Okay, that's a big challenge. Okay, and we have created the models, okay, using different kind of AIML models where we can go and auto extract the data, okay, from the semi structure or the unstructured document, which is extremely, extremely important. Okay, there are so many, so many things, and like, you know, there are certain type of documents where you want to extract the values based on the NLP model. Now, that needs to be trained by on the document is specific. Some customers have very specific documents which they like to train it. So the, there's a trend there where you are giving kind of a tool or a workbench where users can go and train their document themselves. So the adoption level, if you look at it, of the AIML NLP is increasing day by day. I think it has come out of that POC stages and the pilot stages. I think uh, we are seeing a whole trend towards customers going and adopting this as much as they can. And we are also seeing adoption of this in the various products as well, including the RPA products, including the IDP products. Okay, there are a ample number of use cases of AIML. Yes, the people are looking at, you know, depending on their use cases, there are different models that level in the market. Some of them are kind of out of on the shelf. You can use that thing. Some you have to fine tune it. Some you have to customize yourself. But yes, this is something very, very important piece of intelligent automation. And we are seeing a big trend people. Okay. Thanks, Shashi, for that. So now to Rajesh. Um, so you have about a decade of experience in implementing RPA, have implemented RPA in some of the large enterprises across the globe. So from your perspective, what are some of the key factors that anyone who is selecting an RPA solution should consider as part of the product selection process? What are some of the things that definitely need to be considered? Right, sort of. So that's a, a good point, you know, like many of uh, our uh, enterprises are struggling to choose the right product. So I'll try to highlight some of the key factors which should be kept in mind while selecting the right product. So first of all, uh, being, you know, the ease of use and the usability part of it, the learning part of it. So how easy it is to your developers, especially for the citizen developers, to create the bots and to use the debugging features, and uh, being uh, the speed of the implementation is the major deciding factor. So the usability part and the ease of use, learning uh, potential, is a key factor. Then the technology and architecture. So how the bots are, uh, the, the different options are there: attended, unattended, or hybrid automation or what are the ready-made bots available out of the box uh, process libraries available what are the integration capabilities with uh, some of the other uh, you know enterprise applications for example like you know many a times uh, many enterprises are using uh, the application behind the citrix wall is the rpa product uh, able to work with the citrix or not you know those points uh, related to the technology and architecture then the key factor, another key factor is the scalability. So how the deployment uh, is flexible enough, cloud proven and scalable as we discussed, you know, the cloud is going to be the key factor for the uh, scalability. And then what are the different analytics and management, MIS reports available, the ROI reports available, so that you know, uh, you can show uh, major benefits. And then the uh, RPA, uh, tool can be taken forward. The other uh, important factor is the security features because many of these uh, processes uh, deal with uh, confidential data or user specific data. So the uh, you know logs for security or the encryption or authentication levels or you know role based access or uh, you know integration with the AD or compliance and audits are uh, should be available for logs. So all those features are very much uh, required 
in uh, RPA software for the security aspects. And I will yeah. also talk about the vendor experience because the domain expertise or you know, the support the vendor yeah. provides on their software, the documentation it provides, and uh, uh, accuracy of the software. Like, you know, it should not only handle the happy scenario, but it should be able to handle all the exceptions. And last but not the least is the cost. What are the different licensing models? How the acquisition cost works? What are the maintenance and service levels, renewal fee, etc. So these are some of the key factors to be kept in mind when selecting the right IPA product. Back to you, sorry. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Rajesh, for that. Now, a question for you, Sashi. So Rajesh mentioned a lot of uh, factors that should be considered when selecting an RPA product. Now, from your perspective, you have been speaking to a lot of customers over the last 18 months or so. What are the key factors to consider for selecting an IDP solution, an Intel endocrine processing solution? Yes, Saurabh. So that, yes, depending on, yes, we've been talking to multiple customers and we do have our own IDP products. So I'll tell you the holy grail of IDP is the how much is the auto extraction can happen and what is the accuracy of it. These two are the most important factor, okay, from the business user perspective, like how much auto extraction can happen and what is the accuracy of getting it. And accuracy also, I'll talk about it. There are different definitions available in the market for accuracy. It's more at a field level and the document level. How many fields you can extract correctly, automatically, as well as the accurate way. Those are the first two important things which from a business world, you, you get that thing from a business user perspective. But from the product perspective, if you go further down, okay, as you know that, when you start using the IDP, you cannot go and have the all type of documents coming on the day one to you so that you can go and train the engine or train the models. Based on that, and you can do it. One of the important features is the IDP, I would say, is the self learning. As users start using more and more products, okay, as in more and more documents are getting processed, system should learn from the documents, okay, as you're doing it, increasing the throughput in terms of extraction and in terms of the accuracy. And it's for us, how do we make it easy to learn? Okay. Still, if you go out in the market, you see the customers, like when you talk about training an ML model, people think, oh my God, you have to get a good developer, ML developer who will come and teach the thing. He will be costing a good amount of money to you. Okay. While there are certain products which give you very easy, a good SME can go and train the models themselves. So that is another feature which is very important, the IDP. The third important thing is that, yes, there's a whole new generation of the IDP product coming in where the setup of the document definition, you call it taxonomy, you call it ontology, you call it, can that be done by the business users themselves without involving a developer or a programmer? Okay, or in some cases, the people very nicely say that we don't want to involve IT to do that thing, go and explain, SME explains to the IT, somebody writes the code and then puts it, which takes more time, it's difficult, there are gaps in understanding, which results in the lesser accuracy and the lesser extraction. So can the documents can be set up by the business users, including if the new documents are coming in, how quickly and how easily you can set up the document. That is another important feature. Another thing which you have seen it with the customers having a good volume of data, how is scalable is the IDP solution? Okay. Now, if you're processing, let's say 100,000 documents in a day or 50,000 documents in a day, if I scale it up and typically it happens towards a month end or something, sometimes the beginning of the month, if the volumes are high, is your solution is scalable? Can I scale the solution to meet the different SLAs which we have in the business world? So that is another important thing which makes it very important. Another key factor in IDP which I've seen is that uh, HITL, human in the loop screen, okay? As you know that 100% extraction cannot happen, 100% accuracy, you cannot get it because the kind of documents which you get, the kind of images which you get, okay, it does require a human review in between. Does the product have a very intuitive HITL when users can go correct the data very quickly and as less time as possible? Like if you take cases of which I've seen my customers using in shared service centers, captive centers, where more than 500,000 people are working on this tool, Okay, the average handling time for each document, if there's some correction needs to be done, 
okay, that's very important. Every second saved in, results into a good amount of saving. So HITL becomes a very, very important part of the product, which we need to look at it and how generic it is. You cannot go and develop HITL for each and every doc type. It should be able to handle all the document types which you want to process for it. Another key thing is in the IDP is the monitoring and the controlling mechanism. Okay, so many of the products which you see it, there's no visibility in terms of uh, what is happening in the system, how many documents are getting processed, how much time users are taking it, how much time it's taking to process document, what is accuracy, real-time availability of SLAs, real-time availability of accuracy, extraction, and drilling down facility for the complete document lifecycle. Okay, so complete visibility to various stakeholders. It could be as a, as a shop floor shift in charge, or it could be a supervisor, managers, different stakeholders. They should be able to have an absolutely real-time dashboard. They should be able to monitor it from wherever they want to see how the progress is going in the IDP. So these are the few the points which I can think of in the IDP, I think, which we must consider before taking the call. Back to you, Sonam. Okay, thanks, Sashi. Uh, so definitely uh, maybe sort of, sorry one more point i'll add it sorry to interrupt you one very important point is about the data security is yeah. the data product data security is taken care of there are different security standards worldwide the data has privacy has to be maintained because many of the documents which you process in the idp does uh, extract some kind of a personal information some kind of a sensitive data let me put it this way so there should be mechanism to kind of redact it, kind of mask it, make sure the data which is there, the files which are there are pretty secure. So that's another important feature. Sorry, I missed that. Back to you, sir. Yeah, so if you have personal identifiable information, there should be a means to make sure that it's tackled properly. The other aspect is always look, go for POC. Many vendors will say we can do cursive, we can do 99.9, .9. doesn't, happen in real time so absolutely absolutely it. i think yeah you're very right sort of we have seen in many cases okay you go and talk of 95 99 percent accuracy but when you go in the real time production the kind of images they get okay the kind of this things tools work average anywhere i would say over around 75 percent plus minus in there. so now a question for you rajesh and i think you are well placed to answer this based on your experience of implementing RPA. So scalability is a major issue with RPA implementation. So irrespective of what is the valuation of these vendors and how many bots a particular enterprise bought, how many are in production, what is their value to the business, that's a very different equation. So from your perspective, what are some of the good practices for scaling RPA implementation? Right. I think you have said it very right. Uh, scalability has been a major challenge today for most of the organizations. So most of the organizations do make a beginning. They start off, but they are not able to scale up. So with my experience, I can highlight some of the areas which will definitely, you know, uh, enable the scalability is like this. First being the enterprise level vision. So the buy-in from the top management and the collaboration between HR and IT, the way you said in your slide, which is there in front of us, is very important. So the enterprise level, uh, you know, buy-in and the vision for the automation, intelligent automation RPA has to be in place so as to scale up. If you start in pockets and silos, you will not be able to scale up. The second point is also the selection of the right processes and then optimizing them and standardizing them or centralizing them to get based out of them. So that is important. So either you're not selecting the right process or you're not doing justice to the process before automating it. Even the process documentation may not be in place, which will definitely come in the way of automation and then scalability will become a concern. So that's the second point about the scalability. And then the right tool and technology, uh, speed of implementation I talked about. So if you are taking a lot of time, people may lose interest or they feel that it's not being cost effective or it may not be useful to them so the speed of implementation or the right tools right product as i said how do you select the right product and then of course you should start with uh, small processes but you should have a plan and a vision to scale up to the large processes or the you know more complex processes 
and at the same time you should have proper measurements in place roi calculations and all so that you know when you take up some processes to start with you can show the benefits internally and then scale up to the other processes and uh, even adding the ai and ml layers and edge uh, such as said that the idp is also equally important so you should be able to have the readiness to uh, you know jump over the other uh, requirements like idp ai ml for automating more and more processes to scale up further and creating a dedicated team for rp and even setting up the coe is very important setting up the governance structure coe is important because coe plays a very key role in standardizing the procedures in making the decisions setting up the templates for measurements and derailing any automation project which can be brought under control or even it builds the momentum for success so this also enables a very good you know uh, region for scaling it up so setting up the coe and governance structure is also another helpful uh, you know requirement for scaling up so some of these things if they are taken care of the organizations will definitely be able to scale up i'm very sure about that okay right, sort of. thank you. yeah thank you so what do you sashi and uh, i think the title of the webinar is that but uh, what are the key factors to consider for reducing total cost of ownership for document processing and i'm just speaking about idp so the, of course cloud is part of that that model if you deploy it in the cloud there are cost savings to be realized but are there any other aspects if you can just throw some light on that absolutely uh, it's a wonderful question i think yes people look at the idp tool so let me start with the cloud first okay and based on what we have seen with our customers okay we have seen that many of the customers the volume of pages the volume of documents which are coming in okay are not a constant flow what i mean by constant flow is it's not that every day 10000 documents are coming in okay sometimes in the beginning of the month typically sometimes for the end of the month there's a huge volume of document which comes in some cases i have seen it like you know quarterly ending like you know june and september and sometimes yearly ending at the december end or the march end okay you get a huge volume of data to be processed okay or take a case of a text processing okay during the text season you see a lot of documents coming in the volume is extremely high it's not spread over the year okay it just gets concentrated in the last one month or one and a half month 45 days to 60 days now when you have such cases where the volume is very fluctuating okay so this is one case you know that the volumes come towards the beginning of the month or the end of the month and second is because of certain conditions certain laws changing certain government actions happening certain demand happening in the market there is a sudden surge in the processing of the documents okay like if you look at the case of during this uh, uh covid uh, this thing in the last 18 to 20 months there are many cases people couldn't go to the office i think it's a very well known fact people were working from home but most of the documents could not travel to the work from home they cannot travel to the paper employees residences so it needs to be processed within the office and that's where this tool like idp and others are very helpful and you see a sudden surge in the volume what my suggestion is if we go on the cloud okay those that flexibility which you have you can increase the capacity you can scale the solution based on the need okay and you can scale it down when your need is not there so the cost of processing per page more or less remains same it doesn't go very high or very low okay so that is one of the thing which you need and ideally the infrastructure flexibility to achieve that thing okay and which is you get it on the cloud if you go on the on premise you may have a challenges until as you have a scalable or the product provides you that scalability and you have the spare hardware to do that portion second thing what i see is to remove to reduce the total cost of this thing for processing idp document is okay and the tool like idp that's where idp comes people have been using ocr for ages in the past and they've not seen good results coming out in the idp what happens is the more business rules is you put in there okay the models which are there, AI ML models which you train it, okay, the more models which you train it, more effective you make it, okay? And that's where again, come back to my very specific point. One is like, you know, uh, I would say the extraction rate or to extraction rate in the ADP and the accuracy of those fields, okay? By teaching these models, by these models learning from your work, okay? Once this model picks it up, there's a lot of work which goes as a STP. 
without requiring <clears throat> any or practically very less manual intervention. The moment the manual intervention or the human in the loop re load reduces, your total cost of ownership goes down significantly. That is one piece of it. Second is you have an STP and you have these fine models working on it. Your turnaround time is much faster. Okay, I've seen customers, okay, where the documents land up in the night, maybe after 10 p.m., okay, and 10 p.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., because they're global customers, so documents keep coming from all over the world. But by the time the morning the team comes at 8 a.m., okay, many of the documents are already processed and they're ready for consumption. You don't have to spend too much time on doing that thing, which is overall giving a benefit to the customer of the TCO as well, okay? The more manual intervention, the more cost it costs definitely. And there it reduces it. Instead of that, going for a little bit of infrastructure that doesn't cost that much, okay, you get much better results in the IDP. So that's, I think, two, three points which I will definitely mention out here. Yeah, thanks, Sashi. So for a question for you, Rajesh. Uh, we talked about RPA. Then we talked about IDP. So if you could provide some good examples of how RP and IDP can be used together for end-to-end -to -end automation. Sure, Saurabh. So I think uh, I should uh, start with saying that, you know, RP and IDP go hand in hand. They both are essential if you have to achieve end-to-end -end automation because many processes do originate from documents, unstructured documents. And we definitely need IDP to start with and then hand it over to RPA to automate the steps uh, post extraction. So the handshake, uh, handshake happens between RPA and IDP. IDP can take the input from RPA like the document one by one or you know, the emails or any unstructured content, process it, extract the information and pass it on to RPA back to be given to any other out, uh, enterprise application like ERP or uh, CRM application or workflow. So, like it, IDP can handle any unstructured document, like you made, whether it's a PDF tape or multiple documents. And uh, if you are really looking forward to some examples of IDP and RPA being used together, I have, I have a number of examples for that. In the banking uh, sector, the trade process documents like import, export, election documents, they do have a lot of unstructured documents. The KYC documents, like the uh, onboarding documents, the government IDs and all, they are all unstructured uh, documents. Then the tax documents that she was talking about in the tax season, all the supportings are totally unstructured. So that those are the documents where the data has to be extracted, validated, and you know some formatting has to be done before they are put into the tax uh, return filing softwares. Then in the finance and accounting domain, the invoices, purchase orders, legal contracts, or in the logistics space, airway bills, bill of ladings, or you know any uh, kind of uh, packing uh, slips and all are good examples where IDP is needed before the automation can be done using RPA. In the financial sector, the balance sheets or the pay, pay slips, bank statements. Again, the bank statements are another good example where the IDP and RPI are used together. Financial reports, uh, you know, the rating agencies use this IDP and RPI together for our, you know, our client list. And they've been using IDP to extract the information, as Sassi said, from the tables, from the PDFs, and then process it for rating and all. And in the healthcare space, claims processing, health claim processing, or insurance claims, or renewals, or payouts, when the medical reports, which are coming in are all different uh, layouts and formats and unstructured. These are other examples of IDP and RPA where they can be used together. So in each and every industry and each and every function, there are multiple processes where both RPA and IDP are used together. So that's what I can give some examples here. Sort of. Okay. So thanks, Raj. Thanks, Shashi. So we delved into different aspects, uh, including what are the key factors to consider for selecting RPA or IDP, how to make sure that you can scale RPA implementations, how to reduce TCO for document processing using IDP, what are the key factors to consider in that perspective. And then lastly, 
how to use RP and ITP together for achieving end-to-end -end automation. So now I think we can open it up for questions. And uh, yeah, that you should see if there are questions. Sure, sir. So this is a message to the audience. In case you have any questions, please type it in the Q&A box and we'll just take it up uh, as per what the time permits. So we have some questions. So I'll just take it up one after the other. Uh, the first question is around IDP. What kind of accuracy is seen in IDP and which are the factors affecting the accuracy? And let me take that question, uh, Rakesh. It's a very good question. We have been talking about the accuracy and the auto extraction. Tell you that accuracy varies from uh, process to a prop document to document okay so it depends on many things okay so let me discuss some of the parameters uh, on which it depends most important one is the quality of the image okay now if you're getting sometimes you know we get searchable pdf okay in those kind of things even the accuracy can be as high as 90 95 percent okay and it, sometimes yeah, i've seen cases where it has touched about 100 percent as well but in cases where you're getting images like TIFF file, PNG file, JPG files, there, depending on the quality of image, we do image enhancements, we do image processing, but still the images are not so clear. So the extraction rate maybe definitely will be less. Okay. On as a thumb rule, I can tell you on the typically the IDP market, people are talking about 75% plus minus 5, 10% as far as the accuracy and extraction is concerned. That is also at the field level. Okay. If you go at the character level, it could be high. Okay, so that is one thing. So image processing, the quality of image is important. What kind of image processing functions you are doing it? Okay, that is also extremely important. Okay, then the third one is like, you know, what kind of a business rules, validation rules, which you have put it into the system. Okay, which also decides what kind of accuracy you can get it. Business rules setting there. And then the another important factor is that the IDP tools are having machine learning models. Okay, how well you have trained the models, the more variety of documents you get, the more you train the model. Or I would say if you over a period when the model is being used and you keep feeding the model, the model self will onset, your accuracy keeps going up. So these are some of the facts. Back to you, Rahul. Thanks, Shashi. So the next question is around uh, handwriting. So what about cursive handwriting? I mean, can IDP handle that and how can it handle it? That's a, again a very good question. I think in the IDP field, there's still a lot of documents which come in the different handwriting. Yes, we do handwriting. IDP products support handwriting depending on which kind of OCR. There are a specific OCR engines, there are specific tools available for handling such kind of handwriting. And I'll just mention it like, you know, if you just take an English handwriting as an example, the English handwriting varies from Latin America to North America to Europe to Asia Pacific or to Middle East or to Australia, New Zealand. The same sentences, same thing written in English, but the way the writing comes out, the handwriting comes out, it's very different. Okay, so today, yes, IDP is handled. We had a lot of kind of different handwriting. The accuracy could be anywhere between 65 to 75 percent. If it's in a structured box, so I'll qualify that thing. If it's in a structured box, is very specific thing. The accuracy rate is higher, but if it's a running kind of a sentences, okay, or paragraphs which are there, then the accuracy may not be something very great it lines around 65 70 percent somewhere that's the best what we have seen so far thanks Shishi. the next question is which language other than english can true cap handle okay so let me take that so true cap can handle any roman language which is basically got a script similar to english okay there are more than about 20 25 languages which you can handle in the true cap as of today. Thanks, Shishi. So the next question is, uh, is RPA picking up in the cloud? And how does that deploy? Yeah. Okay, Rajesh, you want to take it up? Yeah, yeah I'll take up that. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. So it is picking up uh, on cloud uh, off late. Yes, when it started, it was not. But I think the 
everybody is acknowledging the fact of uh, benefits from the cloud and uh, more and more clients are taking it over and uh, we are seeing a lot of you know requests coming to us where rpi is to be enabled on cloud so that that we will pick up so earlier when we started it was more of on the physical machine then it go to virtual desktops and then cloud so there is a slow and steady progress towards cloud and the the rpa software should be enabled for cloud so uh, as we as such was saying especially in the pandemic situation when people were working remotely and they were you know uh, trying to do it uh, things on the cloud even the bots and the rpa should be enabled on the cloud for the need of the hour so i think that that has been a good growth uh, where the deployment comes on the cloud thanks rajesh the next question is is it must to have an intelligent automation center of excellence okay yes yeah. yeah. we yeah. okay sir you uh, can take it up yeah yes sir you can take it up okay yeah so uh, it's not intelligent automation center of excellence it's any center of excellence whether you are doing an intelligent automation or you are doing integration center of excellence is important to make sure that you have certain uh, frameworks to manage uh, the rpa development process putting them into deployment you don't want to create islands of automation infrastructure or silos For different parts of the enterprise, or at LLUP level, people are experimenting with different tools, and shadow IT is again a problem. So data security, privacy requirements. Uh, the other aspect of an automation COE is you can foster development of automation skills within the enterprise. So initially, you might involve consultants and professional services companies who will develop the bots for you or make sure that you are up and running on IDP. but after that you should be able to do it on your own so development of those automation skills and the change management so coe gives you a professional approach towards all of that and i think that is the way to go when even in the old days when there was integration competency center or service oriented architecture so coe is very important if you want to scale so if you want to implement at lob level with say 5 6 bots then solution architect is fine but if you want to scale at an enterprise level and not just experiment with automation too then co is a must i'll just add on to what saurabh is saying i think the co in a bigger organization as saurabh rightly said okay if you are looking uh, automation as a basic dna of your organization okay you do maybe a few sample automation processes okay you see the results out of it and you have to reach a level where it is starts impacting your business it's no more looking at some saving the cost in terms of fte or in saving in term, terms of some efficiency in the process your business has to be supported digitally and it should become like any new process or new line of business comes in it should become a kind of a auto process where this things happens not that you go and set up a manual process first and then later on after a year or two you think about doing a digital uh, automation or bringing a automation into that it should become a kind of a habit in the organization to do that thing and coe plays a very important role getting all the stakeholders together business stakeholder it stakeholders the automation tool stakeholders the impacted parties okay impacted people everything needs to be considered and that's where the coe role is very important thank you saurabh yep back to you rakesh Thanks, Shashi. Thanks, Sarov. I think we have one more question. Uh, how much of AI ML uh, have you seen being used in RPA? You want me to take up that question, Shashi? Yeah, sure. please go ahead. So, yeah, sure. So it is uh, earlier, uh, as I was saying uh, in the past, it was a very nascent stage, but now more and more. Uh, usage of ai and ml is happening because lots of uh, unstructured content is there which needs to be processed uh, in under automation and also a lot of you know uh, maturity has come in many in many enterprises where they want to take up the processes where ai and ml is a must to for decision making or for you know predictions or for 
some kind of pattern recognitions or some kind of you know uh, what should i say the high end processes need ai and ml so earlier days there were more of pocs i think we like we have done some of the process i can talk about where we have used ai ml along with the rpa like you know for one of the banking clients before the loan can be you know given to go to the uh, you know internet and find out whether there was any negative news item about that particular applicant in the news you know so a lot of you know scraping was needed and going through those unstructured news articles and find out whether there was a ne negative news item so you know those kind of uh, requirements are there where you need to have ai ml because just scraping the uh, screen or scraping the web is not uh, enough you can you can definitely get the information but to make sense out of it you need ai ml so most of the organizations have started migrating and incorporating ai ml even for the fraud detection or for one of the clients we did a, you know some kind of forecasting for the currency in future depending on the various economic factors so all that needed ai ml so i would say of late it has picked up very well and i'm not uh, like you know doubting that in near future that will become one of the minimum criteria for selecting a vendor and a product in automation space Thank Thanks, you, Rajesh. Yeah. Thanks, Rajesh. I think uh, that that's all we had from the questions. So we'll just wait for a few seconds and see if there's anything else. Else we can wind up. I think we are almost done with you know the timeline time as well. Sure. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. If you have any questions, then feel Thank you. free to reach out to us and have a good rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.